Alhamdulillah, wa salam, wa salam, alhamdulillah, wa salam. All praise is due to Allah, Rob, cherisher, and sustainer of all the worlds. May peace and blessings be upon the noble messenger, his family, and companions. Ashabun la ilaha illallah, Ashabun Muhammadan Rasulullah. None has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I'm going to add a little bit to Dr. Abdullah's remarks. I've been in this country in Abha, I just started my 22nd year in Commission of Shay at the King Khalid Air Base. I became a Muslim in the year 2000, which is coming up on 13 years in April. I spent a large part of a large portion of that time in the Abha Dawah Center, more than eight years now. Um, I started making Daiwa shortly after I became Muslim. I was lucky to be involved with some people, like my brother Musa back there. We talk each other. I taught him about how to talk to people in English about Islam, and he taught me a lot about Islam. So if you're lucky enough, and if you stay close to people, and the right people, don't just choose anybody, choose the right people you will end up benefiting each other. My spiritual journey started when I was born, just like everybody else. Um, and I'm hoping it hasn't ended yet, because if my spiritual journey has ended, that means I'm dead. Uh, this is something you carry with you your whole life. Uh, something sometimes it can become stale, but it never ends. That's okay, I'll just talk about her. Ignore them, they're not there. <laughs> uh, most of my life I spent with uh, other people than my mother and my father. We were extremely poor, and my mother and father had five children and they couldn't afford them, so most of my time I spent with my grandmother, grandfather, and uncle. On my grandfather's side, on my mother's side, their name is Wesley, their last name. And if you know some of the history of some of the Christian religions, John Wesley brought the Methodist Church to the United States. From, from, first from Germany, then he went to England, and then he traveled to the United States, and he's the founder of the Methodist Church. A long time ago, a couple of hundred years ago, It didn't mean much to me because I wasn't raised as Methodist. I didn't find out about this until after I became Muslim a few years back. I was raised as what's called a Nazarene, and I didn't remember this until recently. Uh, we went to a church the whole time I was growing up. It was called the Mount Olive Country Chapel, but it was also called Church of the Nazarene. When I was studying recently about the Nazarenes, I found out that they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So it seems like a natural for me to just keep going in the same direction. On my father's side, my grandmother's name was White. If any of you know any more Christian uh, history, <coughs> Ellen White is the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is probably the second biggest church in the United States. And it has many people inside of Kenya, Ghana, all over the coast of Africa have become Seventh-day Adventists. Alhamdulillah, this helps me when I go to talk to them to tell them, yeah, my grandmother was the one that founded your church and she was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the kinds of things you have to draw on your history, your past, your life when you're talking to other people. They know about their life, but they don't know about yours. So draw on these things to talk to other people. Later on in life, as I, I think it was about 16 or 17 years old, I had a fiance, and she belonged to a church called the Church of Christ. I joined their church and was baptized into the Church of Christ, but I had a problem with believing everything they were telling me. And I was raised not to believe Jesus was the Son of God, and now they're saying, when you pray, you must pray in Jesus' name. And I said, no. Why? 
show me why. And they, the minister showed me in the Bible a passage, and I said, no, no, no I don't believe this. Somebody's at it. I said, I can't believe it. So I fought with myself for years about these details that they were telling me, the way I was raised and now the way they were telling me. If you know any of the history of the Christian church in 1972, there was a big uh, revision of the Bible. So when they revised the Bible, they added some stuff in, took some stuff out, and the ministers and pre pre uh, preachers of the time, because they were young, they started preaching what was in the Bible. Later in my speech, I will, I will show you that most Christians don't read. We don't know anything other than I'm Christian, and maybe I can tell you what denomination I am. If I go to church, I can tell you what denomination. It doesn't mean I know anything about it. If I ask you what kind of Muslim you are, you'll say, oh, I'm a Sunni Muslim. And maybe you could talk for days and weeks and months about your religion. If you asked a Christian in the first five minutes, he's done. That's all he knows. You'd be very lucky if he even knows how many books of the Bible there are where to find anything. You'll ask him, where does it say that uh, Jesus is God? Well, it says it. Well, yeah, show me. No, I don't know. So, it was hard for me to understand these things, and the things they were teaching me I could not believe. It, it led later on to me becoming a Buddhist. About 20 years later, I became Buddhist. The Buddhism didn't stick either because I found they were saying things that were not in their book either. I was in a construction trade with my grandfather and my uncle. Uh, my grandfather, he's dead now, mashallah. But he used to love to tell a story about how I started working when I was three years old. He was building his own house, which was a tradition in the place I come from, in a small village. We didn't hire people. You were lucky if you had enough money to buy cement and rocks to build your house. He was pushing a wheelbarrow, you know, the one with the single wheel and the handles, full of dirt from up on the top of the hill down to put in the foundation of the house. And he noticed that every step he took, I right along beside him. Uh, so he stopped work and he went and found a small wheel and some wood and he made a wheelbarrow for my size for three years old. And every time he went up the hill, he would fill my wheelbarrow full, and then he would fill his wheelbarrow full. You were three, huh? Three years old. <coughs> That's why I'm the size I am today. <laughs> <laughs> so that when I started working, and that's when I started construction, started building houses and other things with my family. My whole life I worked hard and listened to what they taught me. They taught me everything I needed to know about my religion. At about 18 years old, I joined the military, the United States Air Force. Uh, this was in 1973, and if most of you remember during that time, there was the Iran crisis where there was no oil, there was no jobs, nothing in the United States. So it made sense to me to join the military. I stayed in the military for about 14 years. Saw many different people. I, did, I didn't see any Muslims, but I saw many different types of Christianity and Jews, and saw many things. At 14 years, I decided I had enough. I got out of the military, and the people said, well, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Saudi Arabia to work. And, and why I said that, I still don't know. I didn't know where Saudi Arabia was. I knew nothing about it. But that's what I said. And sure enough, six months later, I went to Saudi Arabia. When I was leaving home, my grandfather who usually didn't have much to say, he was a man of few words. He said, well, goodbye, good luck, come back and visit. And he said, don't let them Saudis turn you into a Muslim. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, he said, okay, what is a Muslim? And I have no idea what he's talking about. And I didn't even know he knew what a Muslim was. To this day, I didn't know. So I kept thinking, you know, about water Muslims, and he didn't give me any clues, he didn't tell me anything else. Said, Bye, and he was gone, and I got on the plane to come to Saudi Arabia. I came to Riyadh, it's in 1986. And if you, if it's the first Arab country you've ever been to, and you're dumped off in Riyadh, it's, it's quite a shock. But once I got over the shock, 
and started to get acclimated to the weather because it's very hot in Riyadh. It's, it's miserably hot. I got there in October, and I had three or four months to get used to, to that, and then the heat came. Once I got used to where my surroundings were and what I was doing, I started to try to find out the difference in these people and the people where I come from in my home. I kind of began with the decision that there's not much difference in Muslims and Christians. I don't know if it's because of the place I work, because I was working on a military base again, and I see people who are used to speaking English, they're used to dealing with foreigners. Many aircraft companies, many people have been there before me. I was amazed to see that they're not much different. They, they, they were stealing things just like other people in other countries. They were committing adultery, they were chasing women, they were drinking, and even they had the courage to offer it to other people. So my understanding of what Muslims was it's just like everywhere else. So in the year 1989, my contract finished and I went back to the United States to work as a aircraft mechanic for Boeing Aircraft Company. But the whole time I was there, I kept thinking to myself, you know, it felt like something wasn't finished. Like I should be back here. And I didn't have that pleasant of a time, so I was wondering, you know, what what did I expect? But I looked and I found another contract in the beginning of 1991, when the, right after the war had stopped the first time. And I got a contract here in Ottawa for Khamis Mache, which I had no idea where Khamis Mache was or if it was even in Saudi Arabia. I took the contract and came back here, and right away I noticed a difference. Uh, it was not like Riyadh. These people seemed to be different. These were. Uh, what we call at home is country people, people who live in the village, people who are used to taking care of each other, not just go to work, come home, do this, go to work, come home, forget about the guy next door, he makes more of me anyway, he don't need no help. We call those country people. If the neighbor next door was sick, everybody knew it, everybody helped. Uh, that's the kind of people that I found when I got here. It made it easier for me, and I was surprised when the first day I went to the shop to work that all of the Saudis there, nobody was smoking except for one man. Only one man, and they were all trying to get him to stop. Subhanallah, uh, it's not like that now, there's only one man that doesn't smoke. But back then I was amazed by this, you know, the, the camaraderie and the things that uh, I was used to at home. So I was quite surprised and quite pleased to see the people that I worked with and the kind of people they were. You meet people from all kinds of small villages. You know, when you first come here, you think, oh, all these people are from Kamis. The Saudis don't typically go to Riyadh. Or but then you find you have people from all over, from Jizan, from Beish, from Baha. It's, it's all uh, in this area. And they're all the same kind of people. They come from small villages all over to here. While I was in Riyadh, nobody ever invited me to Islam. Nobody ever talked to me about Islam. So it's no wonder I went back home thinking I knew less about Muslims than, than I thought I would. I never got a book. I never heard the word Bible. I don't know what a Bible center is. I know I've seen them go pray sometimes, and I know basically how they did it, but I didn't have any understanding of it. I had a prayer of myself, and I remember when I went home, I found one American Muslim who was praying on the ground, and I gave my prayer up to him. I can remember that when it came time for prayer, I had to tell him to go pray. I was their trainer, and it was time to pray. I said, time for you guys to go pray. Because he never seemed to be smiling or happy about it when I reminded him to go pray. <laughs> For the next nine years after I got to Riyadh, surprisingly enough, it was the same treatment. Nobody offered me a book. Nobody talked to me about Islam. I saw a little more of them being active 
and they, you didn't have to remind them to go pray, but they didn't seem to want to share. It was like a hidden secret. I didn't ask them no questions, and they didn't tell me anything. So I guess it was a two-way street. But I really didn't know what question I wanted to ask. If you don't know anything about Islam, what question are you going to ask? Ask why you pray. You know, say, because Allah said to you. Uh, but that's maybe about the biggest answer you get. But I didn't get any answers. Nobody invited me. Nobody invited me to die with her. Nowhere else. Once in a while, they'd advise to go to the sea to play volleyball or something like that. And I would see them praying and, and how they were acting. About nine years after this, it's, it's in the year 2000, uh, no, not 2000. It was about five years, so it was about 1996. There was a Saudi chief who, he was late for work or something, and I showed him some courtesy and said, don't worry, we'll take care of it, everything's all right. Just, just being a human being, not anything special. But he was very, very excited. Oh, thank you, buddy. He says, you've done me a big favor. I have to repay it. I said, I don't want nothing. I don't need nothing. What are you going to give me? He said, anything you want. Just ask me. I, I said, OK. Do they have a translation of a Quran in English? How many years have I been in Saudi Arabia? And I don't even know there's an English, English translation. He said, yes. I said, OK, bring it for me. I said, I need it. He looked at me kind of crazy, but he said, OK, I will bring it. But it took him a lot of time, maybe three months before he brought it. He said he was looking for just the right one, and I, I don't, still don't know what he was talking about. But he brought an, a Yusuf Ali version of translation of the Indian Quran. If that's the one he chose, that's the hardest one to understand. So if you guys want to bring a Quran to somebody, don't take Yusuf Ali. It's the hardest for the Americans to understand. Because it's written in old world English that we don't speak and we don't understand anymore. <coughs> But he brought me this Quran, and it laid on my desk. And whenever I had a trainee who was having trouble with English, I would practice with this. I'd bring him, and I'd say, OK, read this. And I'd make him read the English side of the translation of the Quran. And whenever he got to a word he didn't understand or something he didn't understand, I'd say, OK, read the Arabic side. And he would read the Arabic side, and he said, oh, now I understand. So it's a good book for teaching English. That's what I thought. In the field that I work, sometimes you work late at night, sometimes you work weekends, some, there's not always somebody there, and you're alone. So when you're alone, you'll pick up anything to read. So I had the Quran on my desk, and I would pick it up and read it. Uh, I liked reading about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I liked uh, some of the similarities, you know, finding out that he became, he got his mission at 45 years old, and I was close to that age. And I read about Yusuf and how he was 40. And most of the prophets were over 40 when they got their uh, enlightenment, or whatever you want to call it, mission in life. That's what we call it in America. But one day, maybe five years after that, and sometimes I considered myself during that five years to be Muslim, which not, would not be strange for me as an American and a Christian before. Because our religion is personal for us. It's, my religion is up to me. It's not up to him. If I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. He may never know. Yeah. The workers next to me may never know if I was a Christian or what kind of Christian I was. And at that time, I was not Christian. I was Buddhist when I was reading. And I always thought that was funny, that I became Buddhist. My mom, my dad, nobody got angry at all. And, and Buddhists are atheists. And when I became Muslim and started believing in God again, they were all upset. It doesn't make any sense. Didn't believe in God? Okay, you're all right. Believe in a Muslim God? No, you're crazy. Get you off to the nut house. Get you fixed. And, and many people have said this, especially the Buddhists. So this Quran stayed on my desk, and I read it, and they read it. And one day, about five years later, there was somebody talking to another American, and he was asking him questions, and it was my habit to listen whenever somebody was talking. It's something my father taught me. So I was listening, and he said, do you believe in only one God? The man said, yes, yes, I do. He said, do you believe that Muhammad was the prophet of God? He said, no, I don't. 
But when he asked those questions, I said yes to both questions. And but he didn't hear me. He was not listening to me. He was listening to the other man. But after he finished talking to the man, I went and talked to him, and I said, yes, I have believed those things for many years. I consider myself to be a Muslim. So the next day, he took me to the Dio Center, and I said, Shahada, and became a Muslim. But that's only the first step. It took 40 years, 46 years, to get back to the place where I was when I was born. And that's only the first step. The rest of it after that is much harder than saying Shabbat. We as Christians are not used to reading. We take our religion sometimes from the minister or preachers or imam, as you call them. For us as Muslims, for new Muslims, we must read. We have to read. We have to have people around us who can lead us in the right direction. So just going to somebody and saying, would you like to be a Muslim? They say yes, and alhamdulillah, it's over, it's finished. It's a long way from finished. It's the beginning of the spiritual journey, and it should last until you die, put in the grave. I promised to give 15 minutes, and it's a quarter till seven, so.